from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's a lot of fun for me to be up here today introducing Joel Achenbach. Uh, Joel has been one of my closest friends for 20 years, and I am an unabashed, unreconstructed, unrepentant Aachen fan. Um, I adore Joel and his wife, Mary Stapp, and you've never seen a more inspiring monument to great parenting than their three incredible daughters. I am, I am, I am not neutral on this. I apologize. So here's the moment where I'm tempted to go rogue. Um, there are some great Joel stories I could tell up here. Um, but the thing is, I have to hand the microphone over to him in a minute. And he has great stories on me. So what we have here is the, the doctrine of mutual assured destruction. So I'm going to behave myself. What I can say is this. Joel is annoying as hell. He's too smart, too talented, too well-read, too gifted a writer. He's a great cook. He even plays wiffle ball well. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think in his youth, Joel did a little modeling. It's not normal, and frankly, it's getting on his friend's nerves. Joel joined the Post from the Miami Herald in 1990, and the place has never been the same since. Uh, he was already well into the salad days of his amazing syndicated column, Why Things Are, when he arrived. In, it, in its eight-year run, it yielded hundreds of columns, three books, and questions to some of the most burning questions of our time, like, since we're mostly made of water, why don't we slosh around more? Because Joel was Joel, he also spotted the internet when the most, of, the most of the rest of us thought it was a passing fad, like Facebook. Joel started the newspaper's first online column called Rough Draft in 1999, and in 2005, he became the Post's first honest-to-God blogger. He created an unstoppable juggernaut called the Aachen Blog that lives on to this day. It's filled with penetrating analysis about the latest development in particle physics, along with old-fashioned rants under headlines like, Are Americans Total Numbskulls? By creating a series of best-selling books, but creating a series of best-selling books, filling the Washington Post with some of its most memorable journalism and writing, feeding the blog beast, writing regularly for National Geographic, and becoming one of the finest science writers in America, Teaching journalism at Princeton and Georgetown, all the while, all while raising three kids, wasn't enough for Joel. He was bored. So what the hell? He decided to write some big whopper books, too. First came Captured by Aliens, a book that explained the science surrounding the search for life beyond our planet that read like a thriller. Then came The Grand Idea, which traced the interwoven tales of George Washington and the Potomac River and gave Joel an excuse to hike the river he loves. And most recently, Joel turned his groundbreaking reporting on the Gulf oil spill into a powerful book called A Hole at the Bottom of the Sea, which I challenge anyone to try to put down. It is a cl it's classic Joel, science meticulously researched and magnificently rendered, filled with richly drawn characters and scenes and sentences that gallop across the page. If you haven't read Joel, you're really missing out on something, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Joel to you today. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Why don't we slosh around more? I can't remember the answer to that. Because you and I, though, have done a fair bit of sloshing around, but we won't talk about that. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for reading. Uh, BP had a slogan, every dollar counts. This was their slogan, their unfortunate slogan before their oil well blew out. Um, you know, my slogan is every reader counts, and I, uh, whether you read the Washington Post, doesn't matter what platform you read it on, or a book, uh, I appreciate you doing that. You know, send me an email, let me know how we're doing, what we can do better, and um, I'd appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the title of my book, A Hole at the Bottom of the Sea, and then more generally about journalism, how we get our stories, how we, we do what we do, and, and then a bit, little bit about the technological uh, civilization that we live in today, this sort of technological, highly engineered capitalist civilization, and, and what that means for human destiny in, in, in this galaxy and in this universe, which is just probably a little bubble in a much larger multiverse. So, and then after about 15 minutes, we'll take questions. Um, so, A Hole at the Bottom of the Sea, that, that, that title, before I had a book, I had a title. I knew that's what I wanted to call it, because this problem was, in a way, very simple. There was a, a well that BP had drilled 
in mile deep water in the Gulf of Mexico and it was now gushing. It was uncapped, it was unplugged. And uh, you know, I know you all remember this, how do you fix this? This is a problem that no one had ever experienced before. In the history of the planet, there had never been a deep water blowout. What I uh, thought about as a parallel was the Apollo 13 crisis, where you had this disabled spacecraft that had partially exploded. It's almost to the moon, three astronauts. How are they going to get them home safely? They got to bring them around the moon and somehow get them back to Earth. This three or four day crisis completely captivated uh, the, the uh, Americans, the whole world. You know, could these engineers find a solution to a problem that no one had ever faced before? In this case, it was not a three or four day crisis. The well gushed for 87 days. It was an 87 day crisis and it was something that uh, they couldn't fix. The experts didn't have a solution. They tried these different things. They tried to activate the blowout preventer with these hot stabs and these remotely operated vehicles. They tried to lower a contain containment dome on it. That didn't work. They tried something called the riser insertion tube tool. That yeah, worked a little bit, but didn't really solve the problem. They tried the top kill. That didn't work. And the whole thing felt like an, almost an indictment of uh, our, our technological savvy, our competence as a civilization, uh, the fact that the experts had a problem they couldn't fix. And I, I, I ask you to remember psychically what that was like, how disturbing that was. In my book, I've tried to capture a little bit of how just the freak out nature of that whole period. Um, there were, one of my sources told me, that the entire reservoir was going to bleed out into the Gulf of Mexico. And this was not 100 million barrels of oil, which is a big reservoir. This was a billion barrels. And he told me, it's just going to paint the Gulf black, and they're never going to be able to solve this problem. So that got my attention. Um, we heard about the loop current that was going to take the oil out of the Gulf and down around the Florida Keys and then up the Florida coast to North Carolina, and the oil was going to hit the Outer Banks and ruin all those nice uh, vacation beaches, then head out past Bermuda onto Europe and Australia and Mars, wherever. It was just going to, it was the, the ultimate nightmare. I would, I'd go on the internet, I'd read about how the, the well was going to crater and turn into, the, the, and the ocean was going to fall down into the reservoir. And in, in that heat and pressure, it would then turn into a volcano. And this giant volcano of, of oil and gas and water was going to explode from the Gulf. And I, heard, I read real stories that there were situations in which ships could, like a bubble of gas could come from the bottom of the Gulf, this giant bubble of, of methane, so huge that essentially the ocean would disappear and ships would fall into the sea. And you heard about the oil cane. Did you hear about the oil cane? This hurricane was going to come along. I don't know why I'm talking so fast. I think it's the tent. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like, it's like a revival. It's like a book revival. Let me tell you about newspapers, OK, print, OK? Uh, but so the, the, the oil cane, the oil cane was going to come up. And it was going to take all that oil, and it was going to fling toxic oil onto the Gulf Coast. Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, sterilized by the oil cane. It was just going to kill all human life. We, we heard all this stuff. And you know, so there was an element of hysteria, maybe, all right? But it is a fact that I uncovered in, in my book, if you, if you are so kind to read the book, you'll see that I got 19,000 pages of government emails and learned that they were talking at the, the highest levels of the government. The government scientists were talking about possibly blowing up the well, okay? Using, not nuclear, I mean, they're not crazy. They were gonna use conventional explosives to just blow it up down there, blow up the hole. And uh, it's a true story that one of the, the advisors to Steve Chu, the energy secretary, was a man named Richard Garwin, 82 years old, in the physics world, a legend, because he'd helped invent the hydrogen bomb, okay? And, and Chu had him on his sort of kitchen cabinet of people who were gonna help solve this problem. And when the idea arose, 
well into the crisis, about two months into the crisis, once again, well, maybe we should blow up the well. Garwin said, no, that's a bad idea because of the uncontrolled nature of an explosion in a rock formation. And they were still saying, well, well, maybe we should try it. And he said, no, actually, I have Enrico Fermi's handwritten notes right here from, from my laboratory book of 1950 that shows the propagation of, of uh, energy in a rock formation. You'll see it's a bad idea to try to blow up the well. And that solved that, OK? When they, when they brought in Enrico Fermi, OK, no more talking about blowing it up. So now, as a reporter covering the story day to day, I, I didn't know all this background stuff. I mean, because the nature of being a reporter is that you, uh, you're often in the dark. You're trying to figure it out. You're, you're making it up as you go. I mean, what did we know about petroleum engineering as of April 20th, 2010, when this tragic event began? It, that, look at, look at the, the Washington Post. This story did not make the front page until April 29th, nine days into the crisis. Why? Because we didn't know what we were looking at. The nature of civilization today is we don't really understand the infrastructure. We don't know where the energy comes from. We don't understand anything about deep water drilling. And uh, the, the, um, it took a while for us to understand that it was a blowout, that it wasn't just a fire. When the story broke, we knew that 11, there was a fire on a rig, 11 people were missing, and that sounded bad, but it didn't sound like it was going to turn into the story of the summer that was going to obsess us day in, day out. It wasn't until they said, oh, by the way, there's a little bit of oil down there, and oh, it's actually worse than that, there's three leaks. And oh, by the way, it's leaking faster than we thought. That suddenly it clicked in. Oh, this could be like the Exxon Valdez. This could be like Alaska, Prince William Sound. And you know, this. And, and we realized this is a crisis. Then it became a front page story and remained so for quite a while. Um, what I I had to do is familiarize myself with the language of the industry. And one of the things I did is I I went to the library and checked out this thousand page. Handbook of Petroleum Engineering, which I didn't really understand it, but I, every morning when I got up, I'd make a cup of coffee and sit down with my big handbook, and I would just sort of leaf through it and try to figure out, just familiarize myself with the words. Now, let me read you a little passage from the beginning of, of my book and uh, the, about, the, about just the language part of this. The disaster involved deep water petroleum engineering, something most of us knew little or nothing about. We knew that oil companies drilled wells in deep water somehow, but few of us had ever heard of a blowout preventer or centralizers or nitrogen foam cement or bottoms up circulation or a cement bond log or the dangers of hydrocarbons in the annulus. The story had its own interesting lexicon, a language crafted by men who use tools. Offshore drilling is tough stuff, hard-edged, coarse, and although there are women in the mix, they're few and far between. There's a heavy maleness even in the office jobs, in the cubicles of the company headquarters. A lot of the people in the industry are guys who got their education on the job, in the oil patch. What they do is complex, difficult and dangerous. They drill holes in the pressurized earth. They extract crude. They pump mud and cement and handle gear weighing tens of thousands of pounds on a rig that weighs millions. Theirs is an environment dedicated to function, not form. And so even the language is masculine. The words often short, blunt, monosyllabic. Spud, hot stab, top kill, junk shot, dump a box, Choke line, kill line, ram, ram block, ram packer, side packer, stack, valve, tick, pod, borehole, bottom hole, dry hole, drill pipe, coning, cylinder gauge, cavity, rat hole, reamer shoe, wiper trip, squeeze job, squib shot, stabber, static head, stop cocking, torque tube. You get the drift. And we went over this beforehand to, to just to help the nice lady here. Um, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, um, so, they, so you had the situation, and they tried to 
stop the leak. They tried, they, they, and, and I actually give BP credit for, for trying with great effort to, to stop the, the, the leak and solve this crisis. The government did its best to help, although was basically useless for, for many weeks at a stretch because the government doesn't do petroleum engineering to speak of. It doesn't have the tools. BP has the tools. There was some talk, well, let's fire BP and get someone else to solve the problem. Well, there's no one else to solve the problem except maybe Exxon or, or Conoco or, or Shell. That's just going to delay the thing. So BP had to fix their own problem. Um, I think that BP made some really fundamental mistakes. And the number one mistake is they never really measured their misery. They ne this is a lesson for anyone with a, with a a crisis like this is take the measure of how bad this situation is. They never measured the flow from the well. And as a result, they tried things that couldn't work. They tried things that, that, that this thing was gushing so fast. It wasn't 5,000 barrels a day. It was more like 50,000 barrels a day. And they never paused to try to figure that out and to figure out the real flow. And as a result, they spent weeks trying things that had no chance of working. They, uh, there's a, a whole separate story which I get into about, well, why did this well blow out to begin with? I mean, they're, they're supposed to not do this. They're, you know, this is not supposed to happen. And there you have a situation that's a, in which, you know, BP initially said, well, it wasn't our accident. It wasn't us. That was Transocean that owns the rig. That was their accident. Within a couple weeks, BP backed off from that and said, okay, you know, we're responsible. What happened was they made all these decisions, both BP and Transocean, but particularly BP, made decisions that in isolation were, might have been defensible. In isolation, not a terrible decision, but saved a little money or saved some time, and on a million dollars a day, time is a lot, as time is money, but maybe elevated the risk a little bit or just took away an extra little layer of redundancy or took away an extra little layer of caution. In isolation, this decision might be okay, but they did this across the board. All the decisions skewed that way. All the decisions elevated the risk a little bit uh, to save a little bit of money. And you wound up with a place, a situation in which you know, on that rig, they had all these safety rules. I went out to the disaster site to one of the rigs that's drilling, that was drilling the relief well. You had to see all kinds of videos about safety. You had to wear a hard hat. You had to have steel-toed uh, boots. You have to have goggles and, and earplugs and gloves. There were rules about carrying a cup of coffee. It had to have a lid on it. You couldn't walk around the deck with a cup of coffee without a lid, lid right? Because that could be dangerous, right? Someone could get scalded, right? Meanwhile, they're, they're, they're drilling in mile deep water into these brittle formations into these highly pressured hydrocarbon reservoirs that have been sealed up for 10 million years, okay? Where, where, and the, the key instruments they have to use are on the bottom of the ocean, a mile deep, where even military submarines don't go that deep. They don't go 5,000 feet deep. You can't go up to your contraption and kick it and see, is there something quirky about it? Everything is done remotely. It's an, it's an unbelievably dangerous thing to do. It can be done safely because, in fact, it has been done safely. But when they said, oh, we've, we've drilled 40,000 wells in the Gulf of Mexico, that's one of the early talking points. We've drilled 40,000 wells in the Gulf of Mexico, never had this problem. The Interior Secretary said something very similar on, on, on television. Well, most of those wells were in 50 or 100 feet of water. They're right, you could see them from the beach. This is out there beyond, on the continental slope. How many wells had been drilled in 5,000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico ever? 400 of which maybe 100 were like this. And how many had been temporarily abandoned with this procedure that they used, the BP used for the Macondo well? I mean, very few. This was the frontier, okay? And on the frontier, you have challenges that you may not be aware of. In the case of BP, as they said to me at the end of this whole thing, they said, you know, we didn't realize the extent to which when we went into the deep water, we were going into a different world. 
okay? It was a different world down there because the, the pressures are so intense. It's totally dark. Everything has to be done remotely with these submarines. Um, the, the thing that bedeviled them was the formation of these ice-like crystals called methane hydrates, which clogged their lines and, and clogged the containment dome. It was a different world down there. And I'm going to step back and do big, big picture just for a second, and then I'll, I'll take some questions. Um, the, the, we, we live in a society that is increasingly engineered. It is increasingly complex. The plant, well, there are seven billion people now. And w the idea that we're somehow filling a niche in nature is, is not uh, really compelling. What we really is happening is we've, we, we now manage and engineer an entire planet. How well do we do that is the question. And the answer is, you know, the, the jury's out. It's unclear, will we be able to uh, run a technological engineered planet without having ghastly blowouts of some kind or another? We live in a time when it seems like there's a disaster every few months. When, I, when my book went to press the first week of, um, of March of this year, and I wrote it in just a mad frenzy trying to get this thing done in time to have the book come out for the anniversary of the blowout. I, I, in my epilogue, I have a paragraph, which I'll read to you. Even if there's not another deep water oil well blowout anytime soon, there will be something that happens, something awful and unexpected that involves the failure of a complex technology. It could happen in outer space, at the bottom of the sea, in a nuclear power plant, on the electrical grid, or somewhere in the computer infrastructure that networks the planet. A few days later, the Japan tragedy happened with this massive earthquake uh, that was, um, I can't remember was it, it was a 9.0, or it was, but it, the, 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 the power of that earthquake was greater than had been projected for that section of the Japan Trench. The tsunami was bigger. It takes out the backup generators uh, that Tsunami does at the Fukushima nuclear power plant, and now you've got a technological disaster on top of a great human disaster because of just the sheer force of the tsunami obliterating whole cities. Um, the, what that show, shows you is just like the blowout in the Gulf, is that there are vulnerabilities in our complex systems, our, these, these elaborate engineering works it's not just that they're foolproof, it's that, that they're not foolproof, it's that, that our, there are hidden pathways that we don't detect whereby things go wrong. And so we're going to have, I think, more of these kinds of technological disasters. Meanwhile, the, the natural disasters that, that have occurred since the beginning of time get worse because of the nature of our society. We have, there's so many of us, there's so much infrastructure. Hurricane Irene came ashore. It was barely category one when it hit the Outer Banks. It was a tropical storm when it came up the East Coast. It's one of the costliest natural disasters in American history. I mean, it's not up there with Katrina or, or Hurricane Andrew or Hurricane Ike, but this was a, you know, a, a really bad event because it knocked out the power grid because of the flooding, because we have so much infrastructure in the way in the path that took right up the East Coast, billions of dollars in damage from a big rain event. Okay, look at the tornadoes we had earlier this year. I mean, Washington shut down because of an earthquake, okay, as you may recall. Um, you know, what was it, 5.8, you know, um, devastating. Um, we, you know, we, so one of the things to think about is how do we deal with our vulnerabilities in this engineered era, how do we have a more resilient society so that the next time something like this happens, we're not knocked off our pins so much? And also, I think that one thing that, that shows with, with the oil spill is you want to not lose your head, okay? Uh, d don't believe everything you read on the internet, for starters, and I say that as a blogger, pioneering blogger, as Kevin said. Um, uh, the, you know, the problems that we face today, I do not believe are necessarily uh, worse than the problems that were faced by um, 
my grandparents during the Great Depression or World War II or during the Cold War when we were faced with, you know, potential nuclear obliteration. You know, we'll, we'll get through the next crisis. We will get through it. But it does require, I think, that we understand the world we're living in, that I think people should read books, okay, and know what's going on. I think people should um, not be afraid to uh, read a little bit about science or technology, familiarize yourself with the language, and understand uh, where you are, you know, in, in the 21st century. Um, thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Your background, in your writing background anyway, seems to have been pretty consistently explaining science to lay people. How did you veer off onto George Washington? Okay, did you hear the question? Yeah, the, yeah so science, but why George Washington? Um, you know, I'm just trying to find something I'm good at, you know. I, <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I, I've been really lucky that the Washington Post has let me do you know, a humor column in the Sunday Magazine, be a feature writer for Style. I wrote for Outlook for a few months, and now and I've covered political campaigns, and they let me do my online Aachen blog, and I'm glad to see some of the, the, the boodlers are here, the people who hang out on my blog, get to see them. And um, uh, the, I think, um, so I've been lucky to be able to try different sorts of things. It, um, in the case of the George Washington book, I live near the river, I hike along the river, I go on up and down the towpath, and I, I just, I started thinking about, well, what's going on here? You know, why, why, why the canal? You know, what are these old ruins doing here? And my idea was to do a book just about the river. And in the course of, of, of doing, the, the book is called The Grand Idea. It came out in 2004. In the course of investigating the river, I discovered that George Washington, in his spare time when he wasn't trying to win the war or be the first president or be the father of his country and so on, he was obsessed with the Potomac. And there was this incredible piece of low-hanging fruit, historical fruit, which is Washington and his river that had never really been written about at book length. And sure enough, Washington's diaries go at at excruciating length into how fascinating the river is to George Washington and how it was going to be the key to everything for the future of the country and for his own personal finances. And so I said, there's a book, and I had a great time uh, writing it. So that's kind of a long answer to thank you for your question. Oh. Yes. Uh, well, well, just over this here. Term, yeah. um, in terms of what you learned as you wrote your book, the concept of the frontier, Tell us about what we should think about in terms of the plan to drill in the Gulf of Alaska. Okay, the question is about should we drill in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, I, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the oil industry is even bigger than you think. Uh, Bob Dudley, who was the CEO of BP, said to me last summer, he said, people don't realize how many resources we have. I mean, this is a company that can take a $40 billion hit because of this oil spill and just keep going. You know, I mean, I, I guarantee you the Washington Post can't do that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll check with Don Graham, but I, I just don't think we could do that. Um, this is a really big company, and the, the, the question is about the Gulf, about Alaska. I think it's the Chuck Cheese Sea. There's, there's, places off the coast of Alaska in the Arctic where uh, some oil companies want to drill. I think it's Shell and maybe Exxon, but I, I, I'm not, it's not really the story I, I, I know exactly, but I'll tell you that while we're talking about them drilling off Alaska, Exxon's Rex Tillerson shook hands with, with Vladimir Putin in Russia, a handshake deal a few months ago to drill off Siberia's Arctic coast in up to 600 feet of water. And the, the, the oil industry is not something that the United States controls. It's like its own vast, you know, quasi, it's not a government, but it's a very big decision-making um, industry that I'm not sure that they get nervous if the Interior Department says we've got some new regulations for you. You know, I mean, they got a whole planet 
that they are drilling. So uh, I, I didn't really answer your question. Should we drill off the Arctic? Um, you know, we had to get the energy from somewhere. Uh, I would like it if it all came from solar power and, and uh, you know, or, or some completely benign source of energy. But I'll be honest, I drove downtown today. So, you know, I, we're all <laughs> complicit in the petroleum industry if we, if we drive, uh, I think. And so um, uh, I, I don't have a, a solid answer to should we drill there or not, or should we drill in deep water? I mean, I think we're going to drill in deep water because that's where the oil is. Yes, ma'am. Are you or are others writing a book about Fukushima? And if so, is it possible, given the closeness of Japanese society and government, to get the whole story? Um, I, I wrote in the newspaper about Fukushima and, and tried to put it in the context of these so-called black swan events that, that are game changers that come out of nowhere one day. But I'm not writing a book about it, and I, I, I don't... Um, I, I don't know that we've had uh, the full story of what happened there. I, I, I'm sort of frustrated in, the, the, you know, the, when we were reporting it back in March, at just basic questions of how did this thing unfold? Why did it happen? Why were the backup generators exposed to a tsunami? You know, what were they thinking? Um, the one thing I, I will note, uh, and this doesn't really answer your question, but is that the, the, the crisis at Fukushima was caused ultimately by a tsunami caused by an earthquake, but the acute problem was the loss of electricity. The tsunami didn't damage any of those six reactors. They simply lost electrical power. And uh, they had a system in which that wasn't supposed to be possible. If you're going to run, build a nuclear power plant, I would suggest that you come up with a way to circulate water without electricity. In fact, that's what the industry has. They have some technology that uses a, a thing called gravity. They put a tank of water up high, and if they need to, they just let, it, it, let the water flow across the reactor, and that helps cool things. No electricity necessary. When you build anything, whether it's a company, you know, a family, or, you know, whatever, Understand that things can and will go wrong. Don't assume that everything is going to work perfectly. So, yes, sir. In North Dakota, over the last few years, there's been this huge oil strike, which is supposedly going to help us uh, reduce our dependence on foreign oil. And as I understand it, it involves drilling down and then sideways and using advanced techniques in very narrow areas. Um, and I just wondered if if you're aware of any uh, potential disasters there or have looked into that. Well, is this oil or gas? It's oil, uh, it's but oil. with some gas. But it's supposed to be mainly oil, and it's going to solve the problem. Is it is, it's the Dakota, Dakota, the, what's the, the name of the formation? The, the Bracken. Uh, the bra Bracken or Bracken. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the, the, there's no question that there's a big movement towards uh, getting more um, hydrocarbons out of the United States proper and certainly out of Canada uh, with, with its um, oil shales. And you, you have just near here the Marcellus sh Shale, which is a big formation of natural gas, with using unconventional methods to go down. They use water that's got a, chemicals in it to fracture the formation, release the gas, and allow it to be um, extracted. And there's a lot of concern about could that contaminate the water supply of, say, New York City or Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or, or, or whatnot. I, I don't know about that formation uh, 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 itself, but I mean, I, I think we're in, in a way we're in the middle of a, of a gold rush, primarily with natural gas in this country, in Louisiana, in Texas, uh, Alabama, Pennsylvania, New York State, and, and out west, Wyoming. There are these big, you know, if you drive now out uh, I 70, you see the big uh, drilling rigs in the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania. I mean, this is going on in real time. It's unconventional uh, drilling, and I think it's one of the, I'm not sure that, that the country on the whole is focused on it, but it's, it's certainly a, a controversial issue of, is it safe to do this kind of fracking of, of formations um, to get out the gas? But I don't know about the oil. Yes, I wonder if you're aware of the South Florida. We're very aware that Cuba is now talking about drilling off their north shore. Right. 
in the water. Yeah, that's correct. So Cuba has, I mean, the Gulf of Mexico is full of oil, and we don't control the whole Gulf of Mexico. We control roughly half of it, you know, is considered territorial waters for the U.S. Mexico has its own drilling operation and had a, a giant oil spill uh, back in 1979, Ixtoc 1, which was before the, the Deepwater Horizon spill was the biggest uh, such oil spill in, in, unintentional in, in history. So Cuba is going to probably drill in deep water. And, uh, you know, the, the, I guess one question is how can the U.S. lead the way in establishing the kinds of best practices that everyone will use because we're, because, because if it's in Cuba, it's going to affect Key West if there's a spill. And I'm not sure, why, but I, I have an idea that it's the Russians that are going to be handling a lot of the drilling off, off of Cuba. So, you know, we live, you know, we live in a global society. You know, we, we, we tend so much to focus on U.S. politics and, and the White House. What can Obama do to fix this? You know, some of these things are bigger than just us. So, but thanks for asking that question. Yes, sir. Well, first, thanks a lot for your writing. I first encountered you more than 10 years ago when I lived on the other side of the country on your online writing, and I've been a fan ever since. So thank, thank you. you. And I wanted to follow up on one of your earlier comments where you mentioned that events like the Deepwater Blowout and the Fukushima disaster they, you seem to say that these were kind of low probability events that everybody assumed were impossible until they happened. And I'm just kind of interested in your contrast to that against like human caused events, terrorism most notably. I'm thinking of Dick Cheney's comment of we have to treat a 1% probability as a certainty. Do you see any real contrast in that? What do you think causes it? Well, that's a great question. I mean, so, so, so Dick Cheney had this 1% doctrine, is that what he called it, which is that you, you have to gear your policy towards these very low probability, high consequence events. I, I, I think that in, in engineering uh, uh, um, challenge is different from a political challenge. You know, I don't think that you'd want to run a country uh, and decide, for example, whether to invade another country based on that 1% doctrine um, uh, idea because you're going to you're going to wind up um, you know squandering a great deal of, of blood and treasure over something that's a low probability event. I mean, I think you you have to pick your battles when you're a policymaker. But if you are if you're an engineer or if you run a complex engineering system, you have to understand that if you have a one percent probability of catastrophic failure and you have a hundred oil wells, okay, I mean, you're in danger of having something blow up in your face right away. You know, um, so it's not that um, that you think this will happen, it's that you, you, you want to have things in place so that, I mean, let me tell you what happened with, with, with the Deepwater Horizon well, just specifically. The, the, the people were trained to understand when a well was out of control, was out of control, that it, whether hydrocarbons were coming in through a barrier. They had a test that they would do. The test they did at the Deepwater Horizon was uh, called a negative pressure test. They did this the night of April 20th. In the final hours of this whole thing, they tested the well to see if the cement had held. The result they got showed, no, we've got a problem. There's, there, there, there's pressure coming up this pipe where there shouldn't be. And they had to decide, well, what does that mean? How do we interpret this result? And, they, and then what they decided was, we don't like this result, but let's try the test again, and we'll try it over on this other line over here. So they actually ignored the result and did a do-over because they were looking for a certain kind of answer. They tested this other line and didn't see any pressure. They said, okay, that's the answer we want. Let's keep pulling the mud out of the well. Okay, let's keep pulling the mud out. The mud is this heavy stuff that, as it turned out, is the only thing keeping it from exploding. As they pull the mud out, the gas rises and just spurts the mud out everywhere. The gas rises, explodes, inferno. Now, why did the second test show no pressure. Well, one possibility is that 
they wanted to get rid of a whole bunch of gunk they had on the rig. This, this, this really thick gunk that they had used for, they wanted to use for some other purpose. Under the environmental laws, if you sent the gunk down the well and used it in the well, you could then pull it back up and dump it in the Gulf of Mexico, just throw it away. If you didn't use it down the well, you had to dispose of it onshore as a hazardous waste. So to get around as this environmental regulation, they decided to use this gunk in the well as what they call a spacer fluid. The gunk may have clogged the line, the second line, and caused the, the, the reading that showed no pressure in the well. Because they were basically doing something kind of horsing around, a non-standard procedure, uh, making it up as they were going, they may have thrown off their test and given themselves a, 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 a uh, and misinterpreted what was going on. Because the equipment's at the bottom of the, of the sea, they can't go up and wiggle it and check it. And as a result, they, they thought they had a good cement job. They didn't. I haven't really answered your question again, but the, the point is, is that you have to have best practices when, when, you, when you have something that's potentially dangerous. You can't be horsing around with something as cockamamie as, hey, let's send this stuff down the well, then we can just dump it in the ocean. That's not best practices. So, um, you, know, I, 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 you know, I I think as far as terrorist events, you know, you, you don't, you, you don't want to gear your entire society towards something that's unlikely, okay? Uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, on the off chance that some other country might have weapons of mass destruction, I don't think you should send in the 101st Airborne. Uh, that, that's my opinion on that. But thanks for your question. So. All right, I think we're done. Uh, if there's any, any other questions, I see no one else. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.